Buzz was a cornerstone in game mythology for at least five decades, and characters and phrases from the movie became a coded legend for a subculture. Homosexuals in the United States military identified themselves as friends of Dorothy, just as I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It was a traditional opening line for out-of-towners making their debuts in metropolitan gay bars. Garland's version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow became an anthem of pain for homosexuals who perceived themselves as belonging to a despised minority. And this is, uh, was written in 1994, um, when there were a whole bunch of Oz themed plays as part of Stonewall 25 in New York. It was the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall riots uh, that happened in 1969. And ben Brantley, who's a theater critic, wrote this piece. Um, and then stuff from the Times got reprinted in books, so you can actually find it in the book. So this is, you know, the New York Times says that it's got to be true, right? <laughs> uh, this was just a regular showing of the movie on uh, TV, and uh, the <coughs> TNT Turner took out money and put this ad in the, in the gay papers from that happened a couple of many ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. This is a group in Connecticut uh, called the Northeast Ursa Men, the Bears, and they have a, a spooky bear weekend in Provincetown every year, and one year at Oz was the theme for their advertising. So what, you often see Oz in gay contexts. That's what this is sort of a phenomenon I'm talking about. Uh, Euro Pride is a pride celebration throughout Europe, and each, each year they pick a city and a country for the pride parade to happen. It doesn't mean there aren't other smaller pride parades in France, Italy, or wherever, but there's a big massive one in people countries from all over Europe. Judy, this was um, created by a card company called Rock Shots. It's since gone out of business. Let me get this little handle out of the frame here. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the New Yorker. So we've got a lot of Judy and Oz imagery um, gay references in the gay context, people dressing up as characters from the movie and pride parades and so on. And then there are, so there are these questions that, that I have. That a lot of people think that Judy is something we use in gay in the moment film. And when I talked about the research, often they say sort of dismissively, oh, it's just about Judy, right? As if that somehow explains everything. Um, and many people assume that the friend, friend of Dorothy is the Dorothy in. Friend of Dorothy is a gay slang for gay men. There's a lot of people assume that the, um, the origin is, is Dorothy from the movie. And people also think that um, gay grief over Judy Garland's funeral, which was the night, first night of the Stonewall Riots in 1969 in the village in New York, some, there's a connection there that a lot of people make. And people often assume that the song of the Rainbow is connected to. Um, this, the um, rainbow is a symbol of gay pride. So my, the research that I've done into gay love of Oz in general has had two, two parts. Um, I gave a questionnaire to over 100 gay Oz fans and had responses from men about their own feelings about the MGM movie. It could be the Oz books. Their favorite version could be Wicked or The Wiz. Um, so generally, I'm talking about how individual gay men respond to different stories set in the land of Oz, regardless of the medium or the version. Um, so that's sort of the, the individual level. But then there's also a subcultural thing going on with the MGM movie, specifically. Those the images were all, you don't really see illustrations from Baum's Oz books in the gay press the way you do you see images from the MGM movie. Um, this one, I did find one, Ethan Morton, who was a gay novelist and critic in the 70s and 80s, had a of short stories called I'm Feeling Not in Kansas Anymore. And it wasn't about um, Oz, it was just about people coming to New York and living their free gay life there. But he, he knew about the Oz books, and in some ads for his book, there was an illustration of from the books, not from the movie. But generally, it's the MGM imagery is what you see in public gay, in gay, gay subculture. When I, but when I gave out the questionnaires to people, one of the things that I found was that there wasn't really a distinction between film fans and book fans or whiz fans or, or um, wicked fans. Um, they often had the same character, they identified favorite character, they often identified with the same person and, and um, 
a lot of the same themes came up regardless of which your favorite version was. And people could like more than one. They could love the MGM movie, but also like Wicked. Um, so it's not like really an either or that you can just isolate someone and say, he or she is only a fan of, well, he in this case, of, of one version. It, let it be four, four things a little more detail. Um, Judy is the cause of, of a love of the movie. Um, one reason why this can't be the case is that of the over 108 questionnaires that were filled out by 108 people, 106 of them became fans of whatever version it was that was their favorite when they were very young, three, four, or five, or six years old. So <coughs> if it was Judy Love or Judy as gay icons, why gay men went to the MGM movie, that wouldn't explain the fact that all these kids, when they're three or four or five, love the Oz books or the movie or whatever. Okay, so the first thing is that love of the film began almost universally as kids. Um, and the film is not differentiated from other versions. But also I asked um, people for their favorite movies in addition to The Wizard of Oz. And very few Judy movies came up. Dozens and dozens of movies were mentioned. Um, some people listed six or ten movies, some people might list one or two other favorites. And you'd think if, if people were real Judy fans, they would like other Judy movies. And the star is born, I think it's mentioned twice, it's playing in the Castro Theater tonight, I just noticed. Um, but if, again, if, if, it's, if it's Judy per se, we would think other Judy movies would be fan favorites, which was not the case. Um, and Judy in general wasn't mentioned that much. I mean, people did talk about her marvelous performances, Dorothy, in the movie, but it wasn't overwhelming, hand smattering of people who talked about Judy Garland in detail. And there were a couple of base, big Judy fans among the 100 people I talked, at, talked to, but, but again, most people, it wasn't, it wasn't really about Judy. The appeal of Oz for gay males is really much deeper. It's about the themes and the stories, regardless of the version. Things like fantasy, escape, gender roles, celebration of difference, family, home, and being true to oneself. And these themes I've talked about in the book, and I'm not going to talk about them tonight, so I'm into gay folk here. But I have chapters on this stuff about celebration of difference in gender roles and so on, and spell out all the ways in which the different stories set in Oz give, um, for example, give gender atypical boys alternate role models, like the lion as a sissy, for example. Okay, so Judy isn't the cause of the gay love cause. Fred and Dorothy, this is the one that is the most complicated. You can ask two things. First, what Dorothy is it? And when, as a, a, a auxiliary question, is when did the expression first became uh, used commonly as gay slang. So Judy was a gay icon starting in the 50s when she gave solo concerts after she was fired by MGM. And she had a, a, a suicide attempt and came back from that. And a lot of people sort of date her gay icons from then. There were documented gay clacks of, of um, um, groups of gay men at her concerts in the 50s. If you look at reference sources, about slang, many of them list say that Fred Dorothy is referring to Judy's role as Dorothy in the movie. And it's sort of odd. I mean, why isn't it Friends of Judy? It's really about her. Uh, of course, her companions in the movie were all non macho, very unusual males with de deficiencies of various sorts. The lion declares himself a sissy, and the two women cries, and the scarecrow is you know, more floppy and the opposite is sort of John Wayne, Richard and Green type. Um, but you know, it still seems funny to me. But I don't know. Anyway, uh, but that's one possibility that it is Jew. The thing is that, uh, okay, most, a lot of slang dictionaries just uh, don't say, they just define it, they don't say where it comes from. But some do mention Jew. But there's an alternate theory. Some people say it was really Dorothy Parker um, that gave rise to the expression. Friend of Dorothy. And she was in the Algonquin Round Table, which was a gathering of um, uh, literary types in New York in the 1930s. And then she moved to LA in the 50s and was a uh, screenwriter in Hollywood and was married twice to a bisexual man, Alan Campbell. They got divorced and they got remarried. And she talked a little bit about, about gay men in some of her writings. It's an article in the New Yorker. Um, it's an article by 
Hilton Owls. And he doesn't talk about the phrase in the article at all. But the title of the, of the profile of Dorothy Dean was called Friends of Dorothy. Because it was about these um, salons that she had and the gay men that gathered around her. She, um, she was a student in Cambridge in the 50s. And then she came to New York after college. And from 62 to 1980, she was very involved in the literary and art world in New York. And so she <coughs> preferred the company of gay men to um, other, other humans. Uh, she wrote about gay film, uh, the old lavender cinema courier uh, in 1975. And this New Yorker article came out in 1995. But there are people who think of Dorothy Dean. And I think it's sort of just because of the, the only thing I can connect is really the article on the title of the article. But some people, and then in various speculations, the fourth possibility is Dorothy King. You can find a picture of her. But she was a socialite in um, early 20th century London. And she held soirees where gay men would, quote, sing, dance, play charades, and generally have a happy gay old time. And pretty soon, these officers began to identify other like-minded chaps by asking others, is he musical? So one, one, person, <laughs> one person wrote, and, uh, oh, oh, is he musical, and or is he a friend of Dorothy's? Um, this, I found this online, and people were discussing uh, the, the origin of the theory. Uh, First, it appeared in Madison in the column for Mr. Wright in the Isthmus in 2002. There is one other possibility, in addition to these four people, is that there's no particular referent. Um, a referent is like, if I use the word cell phone, that's language. What it refers to is the physical object. So it's the referent of the phrase and the language is the physical object. So it's possible that there's no actual, per actual Dorothy out there. And I talked to one linguist who sort of um, an expert in this kind of thing, he said, oops, he said that, well, there could be no reference. And there's, there are other phrases. There's a, um, drunk as Cooter Brown is an expression down in the South. And there's nobody named Cooter Brown. There never was. It was just an expression that came up. So it could be that Friend of Dorothy is like that. But there wasn't any, any particular historical Dorothy that, that it was before. We have these various possibilities that different people have written about. But if you look, I, I went obsessive in, in reference sources here and um, most a lot of gay slangs don't miss friend of Dorothy at all. Um, the, the ones early ones in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and there are seven academic empirical research studies in, in the 60s through 85 that don't mention the phrase at all. And in the four academic discussions of gay codes and coded language, even as late as 96 that don't even mention the expression. One of the research studies uh, had people in the field asking um, gay men for slang words as synonyms for homosexual. And they come up with this list of like 120 words, things like, or expressions like hoofder, fudge packer, pansy, those kinds of things. And you'd think of this, and some of them I've never even heard of. You know, I mean, maybe anybody here could think of 10 or 20, maybe, but 100 is a lot of synonyms. And, um, it was from all, I mean, different classes. People were in prison. There was, uh, I'm not sure how far in the field it went from the United States, the research. But the fact that in this long, long list of 120, Friend of Dorothy wasn't there. And this is in the late 60s. That the, in a linguistic journal, we published this list of synonyms. And it just seems very strange that Friend of Dorothy wasn't listed. Um, of course, you can't prove a negative. If you don't have evidence for something, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's a logical possibility you can't prove that something doesn't exist. But it's very suspicious that all of these sources didn't list friend Dorothy. So which what ones do? They tend to be at 1990s or later layers. And they may or may not cite the engines or as, as the, the, the origin. Uh, the OED, big famous reference source for etymology, gives a citation from 1985 that I couldn't find. I think it's wrong. I mean, there are, it's a long, complicated story, but I, I think they blew it. <laughs> they say it doesn't exist. I mean, I've gone through what I've got a PhD in library science, and I went through dozens of databases, and it's a long, complicated story. I don't want to go into it. Anyway, um, so some dictionaries, 1990s and later, and of course, you see it a lot in the gay press in the in the 90s and so on. Um, and there was one recent relatively recent collection of gay slang from 2002. 
I guess what's amazing is that even if Judy Garland's portrayal of Dorothy Gale in Kansas isn't the origin of the phrase that so many people think it is, and with the, the slang dictionaries, what happens is that they cite each other and they pick up from each other. It's not like independently they've done research, but once you see it documented somewhere, then people, you know, it's the same with the bibliography. You quote someone and you quote someone who quotes someone. And so um, the fact that those slang dictionaries do list Brenda Dorothy, I think, uh, do list Judy Garland as the referent, I think it's sort of picking up from each other. Um, but it's striking that so many people believe this. I mean, how many people here assumed that that's that the friend of Dorothy was from the MGM movie? But another one related to Judy, not the MGM movie, but just Judy in general, was that her funeral happened on the night on June 27, 1969, the Stonewall riots broke out in New York City. They lasted for several days, but they started the night of her funeral. And there's this theory that you read about in the gay press that says that gay men were either full of grief that somehow exploded in the riot, or that there was so much frustration because the lines for the funeral were so long that they waited, <laughs> for, waited for hours to see her casket. Um, when they went out and had a drink at the stone and started riot. Um, As one does. <laughs> Um, oh, so the, oh, that's the right on the right, the funeral, outside the funeral on the left. Um, so there are different relationships with, with this claim. Some people um, just say it was a backdrop, or it was associated somehow. Um, and Ben Brantley earlier said it probably helped provoke the riots. Um, some people actually claim that it was a cause. So some do claim a cause. In fact, Jeremiah Newton says in, a, in an interview that I was at the riots. Judy had a part in it. She was in our minds. She was in our hearts. She was in our souls. Um, there have been a couple of historical accounts of the riots. Uh, and the historians generally say that that theory doesn't make any sense. First, it was kids who were rioting, and they were not Judy fans. They were street kids who were into rock, uh, the wrong generation. It wasn't the older, middle class, up and down gay men who were, were Judy fans. Um, and the other thing that uh, Douglas Carter says in his book Stonewall um, is that there are none of the contemporary accounts for the riots talk about Judy and the funeral. So in the Village Voice or wherever it was written about, or the New York Times, um, during the days of the riots, none of the journalists there make the connection with Judy's funeral. It only happens sometime later. Um, and then there are other ways of talking about the relationship. Vito Russo said that Judy stood for the old gay world and the riots began a new one. So it's sort of a metaphoric handing of the baton from one generation to another. Um, and a lot of people say legend has it and that it's a nice story that has to be true. That's sort of what the way people think about it. It's such a weird coincidence. It's got to be true. Mm -hmm. So keep that in the back of your mind. We'll move on to one more. Uh, Oz, Judy, gay history thing. So many people think that the Rainbow Flag, which was uh, designed by Gilbert Baker here in San Francisco in 1978, that he had the rainbow theme. He was inspired by the song of the rainbow. So people made that rainbow connection. Um, and I actually got to talk to him about it a year before he died. And he said he was into rock music. and. The rainbow had to do with the spirituality of the different colors, each stood for a different aspect of spirituality. And it was a way of talking about how all of humanity is gathered together in these different colors. Um, so he said to me that you know, it wasn't. Um, but it's really interesting. I just bought this today at the store, uh, Kitty Corner here, um, Dog Eared Books. Um, um, this is a new kids book called Sewing the Rainbow. And they talk about Gilbert Baker growing up in Kansas and coming to San Francisco and feeling free to live a colorful life. Um, sort of using the metaphor of the black and white Kansas. Um, San Francisco is colorful. It says at the very end, this is sort of the notes for adults after the, the picture book. In 1994, he sewed a mile-long rainbow flag to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. Fifteen years later, in 2009, Gilbert honored the 40th anniversary of Stonewall by sewing 
a ruby sequined banner, partly to recognize the ruby anniversary, I guess, gifts, you know, 10, 20 years, the 40 year anniversary is um, apparently is ruby, and partly as a symbolic nod to the film that mirrored his own life in so many ways, The Wizard of Oz. <coughs> so the author here talks about film mirroring his life in general, it doesn't say anything about the over the rainbow connection. It's really cool, it's like sparkling. <laughs> You've got these beliefs that many people hang on to that there's no real evidence for. As again, you can't prove the negative except in the case of Bill Baker. I talked to him and he said, no. Let's sort of just back up and think about gay culture or culture in general. What is, what is culture and what is folklore? Well, folklore is traditionally it's oral things that are handed down from one generation to the other. Jokes or myths. But, but people have written about the, the purpose is to sort of hand down culture. It's a little bit of culture that gets handed down from one person to the next. And gay culture is different than, and the gay community is different than traditional tribal cultures <coughs> um, or even, you know, mainstream American culture. In that, for the most part, we don't have parents who hand it down. If you're in some tribe in um, the South Sea Islands, you get your modes of behavior and your mores and your dress and everything um, passed down from your parents and your peer groups. But for the most part, gay kids don't grow up with gay parents who hand down the culture, so you get it from other people. Um, the gay press, from mentors, from um, gay media and so on. Um, and we really only have had a, a, a public, well distributed gay media after Stonewall. It's not like suddenly zillions of papers came out all of a sudden in June, but um, people, it wasn't, we didn't really have, except for, I mean, there were a handful of associations like Mattachine Society and um, those leaders that had, had newsletters, and, and the latter um, for lesbians was this very, very treasured periodical that was, was scary to send it through the mail, people would hand it whispers from one person, one friend to the next. And there were some um, mail order sexual magazines and so on before Storm, but we didn't really have an out gay press until after 1969 when these issues could be talked about, like what's a list of gay, favorite gay movies, or you know, do you like Tool and Bankhead more than Judy, uh, more than Betty Davis, that kind of thing. Um, So, oh, here's one, one nice quote. Is that folklore develops, expresses, and maintains social bonds that create a group. And modern urban folklore is passed along and given credence by appearing in print. So and how, does this, how do these things develop? Well, usually one person comes up with something, or maybe simultaneously one or two or three people, and passes it to someone else, and then it either takes or not. You can think of like a joke that I might make up tells us somebody and it falls flat. Some other joke I make up and suddenly is gone viral. You know, before the internet, some things caught on and some things didn't. And it's sort of mysterious why some bits of folklore like jokes, you know, suddenly, suddenly are passed on and some don't. Um, and at some point, certain things will get institutionalized. You'll see a list of puns, favorite jokes, or whatever. Um, and things get passed on in a more straightforward way. Um, and then things, then bits and pieces of information might be visible in print and other media, so you don't, that's sort of outside the traditional folk process of people just talking to each other. So that, with all this sort of thinking about folklore and, um, and culture and how it gets passed on, let's look at these things again. So, you know, given the fact that Judy <coughs> is or was a gay icon, that's an aspect of culture that pe gay culture that people may or may not know. And often, older gay men will tell you know, in a, that we don't know about Judy Holland, what her story was. Um, the same thing, another aspect of gay culture is that this expression exists and this is what it means. Um, and it's certainly true that gay men and others fought police at the storm of the night of Judy's funeral. And Over the Rainbow, with its, its, it's called an anthem of longing, and it certainly speaks to gay men. And it's true that the rainbow flag is a gay symbol. So I think everybody can agree with the left hand column. But then, what I'm calling folkloric belief is related to these. Um, the, the Judy is the reason the gay men love the film. 
and the fact that people say that uh, Fanny Dorothy was used in the 40, even in the late 40s in World War II, some people have claimed, um, and certainly people say in the 50s and 60s, the idea was that you didn't want to reveal that you were gay in a, in a mixed social setting. You suspected someone else was gay, so you went up and said, are you a friend of Dorothy? And if they said yes, that means that that was a code for saying yes, we mean I'm also gay. That's what people say the context of the slang was originally, and that this happened in the 50s and 60s. Um, and again, there's this, what I'm calling folkloric belief that gay grief over Judy's death gave rise to the riots. And finally, the rainbow was, was chosen because of the song of the rainbow. So what's interesting is that they're all sort of intertwined. They all have to do with Judy and the MGM movie. The myths, which are a little more highfalutin than folklore, but it's the same idea as that these things that are stories that are part of the culture. And they, um, they give you a sense of belonging if you have a shared myth or a shared bit of folklore. Um, they help. Joseph Campbell talks about how myth, myths also are part of your identity and how you create your identity. And they also, myths often function as part of giving people a, a sense of history. And they also can help you integrate into the, into the group that you're a part of. What I think is going on here is that, is that these are the needs that these folklore beliefs fulfill. That we share this knowledge of these things that Judy was a, uh, any one of them. Um, and this shared knowledge makes you part of the culture. It makes you feel you belong, you've got more of a gay identity. And especially the history thing, I think the idea that this stuff was happening in the 50s and 60s, people were saying um, Fred and Dorothy as a, as a code. I have no evidence for it that it happened that long ago. It's just these claims appear in print. And again, you can't disprove a negative. I do have archivist friends keeping their eye open. Imagine if somebody came across a diary that said, oh, I went to this party and I learned this guy was offended badly. Um, but since it's slang, and in fact it's coded slang in particular, it's not something you'd see necessarily in print way back then. So again, people may, or maybe a small group of people used it back in the 40s or 50s, but it, what I'm saying is that it wasn't generally shared in part of the culture at large until much later, way post on the wall. It didn't show up into the slang dictionaries until the 80s. Um, but we want to think that it goes back. And it makes us feel good. It makes us feel part of a larger history. To think that, that we have this connection with these post stonewall people, that we still see the movie, we know who Judy Garland is, and so it's sort of part of, of gay culture that serves these mythic needs of, um, of helping people belong, of reinforcing our identity, of, giving you a sense of history that you need to be less isolated um, from, from the culture that you're a part of. So, I mean, this is totally speculative. There's no way to know that this is what's going on. It just seems to me that um, being connected to something larger than yourself is something that we all yearn for. And being part of this culture this way and, and believing in these um, probably untrue things makes us feel part of something larger than ourselves. Um, especially if we feel different from family members and are often rejected by them. You don't get a sense of belonging from your family, so these are the kinds of things that make you, if you share these, this knowledge or these beliefs, it makes you feel part of something larger. It gives you a sense of group cohesion. Um, oh, I think about origins. Uh, many traditional history stories of origins the earth being formed, that kind of thing, the gods. And in effect, three of the five beliefs are stories of origin. We've got um, this is where the, the flag came from. This is the solar rise came from that. Um, Dorothy, you can say Dorothy's role was the origin of the expression. Pull all these things together. If you've got history, origins, and identity, the gay love of the MGM film, Judy Garland, Friend of Dorothy, the Stonewall Rides, and the Rainbow Flags, they're all important parts of, of gay culture, sort of on separate pedestals, you can think of them. But because they're all about Oz and Judy, they reinforce each other, and that sort of integrates the whole thing together. So 
Oz as a, as a myth sort of is a peg to hang all these different things on. Um, and they're related to the gay appeal of Oz. So even people who don't necessarily love Oz themselves can still hold on to these beliefs. And it's sort of satisfying in a way to have one related set of explanations for diverse phenomena. It's sort of pleasing in an Occam's razor kind of way. It's like having um, appealing to one phenomenon that can explain more than one thing. And I think it's so great because it, it conjures up all these different images. I mean, presumably this is, given the facts, this is happening in 1939 when the movie first came out, um, that they would be open enough to be able to kiss in front of the movie. And once in a while, it's the name of the painting. So I think it's sort of a nice um, summary of the feelings behind all these Julie Oz and history kinds of things. So that's it. I'd love to hear what you think about it.